think someone else had been cast to play the good Dr. Johnny and then decided not to at the last minute. And it was a three week contract and I looked at it and I thought, that looks like a bit of fun and a great television opportunity. So um, had a go, got the job. <laughs> I remember walking into the studio in my doctor's surgical outfit playing an anaesthetist and it was my first scene was all this expensive medical equipment that I didn't know which way was up. Walked into the studio and expected to see, I don't know, something going on in there and it was absolutely quiet and dark and I was like, there was nobody there. <laughs> like, I'm in the wrong place, what's going on here? Started sort of stumbling around in there and walked through um, one of the set doors and bam, there it was. The lights, the cameras, the boom operators, the directors, the, all the actors, the surgical scene, the person lying on the bed ready to go. And I was like, okay, <laughs> just cruise on through, just cruise on through. And I remember saying to um, Michael Galvin, who I knew from Wellington, I was like, mate, help me. <laughs> like, how do you do this? How do you survive this? How do you slot into this machine and survive it? And he said, Stel, I can't help you, nobody can help you. It's like, you have to find your own way to swim here or you will drown. It will, it'll just overwhelm you. And um, he said, I can't, there's nothing I can do for you except wish you well, <laughs> good luck. It was a three week contract. It turned into a two month contract. It turned into a three month contract. It turned into a six month contract. It turned into five years of my life. An extraordinary, amazing job, life changing job. It's wonderful. The thing I loved about Johnny, playing Johnny, and I didn't even realise this until people started coming up to me in the street, is that he really polarised people. The character really polarised people. I'd have folks come up to me in the supermarket and go, Oh, that Johnny, he's such a great father and he's a lovely guy. I bet he'd make a wonderful husband and all that kind of stuff. And then there'd be other people who would come up to me and go, you're that doctor, aren't you? Because he was a mixed bag as a character. He was fun to play in that regard. He was unpredictable. Well, I guess it was the, the Dally background, perhaps. Um, um, volatile and unpredictable and also had his charming side. I had um, um, once at a, at a wedding, <laughs> standing in a little circle, I was being introduced to people that I didn't know. And I was introduced to one person as we were going around the circle. And this particular person went, someone went, oh, this is Stelios. And uh, she went, no, you're not. You're that doctor. And she punched me. She punched me on the chin, like actually punched me. <laughs> For, um, for whatever current crimes Johnny was committing on the television there. And I, and like, I stood there and the world kind of went, shook a little bit as it does. And I was like, what exactly is going on in your head right now? It's like you are a grown adult, intelligent human being. And it's just fascinating. It's fascinating to look that person in the eye and think, because everybody else in the circle, their jaws just dropped open and nobody kind of understood what was transacting. It was weird. It was, and lots of, lots of, there were lots of little moments like that, lots of little strange things. It was wonderful after Shortland Street to get the opportunity to go beyond soap opera, to go, um, this, this guy, one trick pony, is we're just going to play the doctor forever and a day. And um, Mike was a wonderful character, um, messed up. Um, there was, uh, Jay and I had to like, was physical fight in it and he's a huge guy. So he and I were like eye to eye. I remember, don't ever let a film crew in your house. <laughs> like, we shot in a house in the, uh, in the back streets of um, Ponsonby and pretty much trashed the joint that night because him and me, it was like the two Terminators fighting in the hospital. We went through the plaster wall. <laughs> it was great fun, but the part, um, you know, I remember saying to Chris, or Chris Bailey, the producer, I was like, um, thanks for the opportunity. It's great to get the opportunity to, to go beyond Shortland Street. And he said, mate, you did the best audition. It was that simple. The Sheriff of Gungahlin, I used to call him, because I'd sit there um, armed to the teeth, 
uh, in, in full police uniform sitting in there in my country copper's um, land cruiser on the edge of the set about to drive into the set and do my thing and the locals would come up and go, what's going on over there, mate? And <laughs> talk, because they thought they were talking to the local cop. And <laughs> I'd just go, oh, they're shooting McLeod's daughters over there, mate. <laughs> it's priceless. And then I'd just drive in and, and do my thing. Aaron Jeffrey, who's a Kiwi and a lovely bloke, um, was kind of the head honcho bloke of the show at the time. And they needed someone who could physically match him, physically stand up to him and be believable as someone who could match him. And um, here I was thinking, um, I was expecting to be in a precarious environment. And I couldn't have been more wrong. Never come across a nicer bunch of people, quite frankly. They were all extremely welcoming, all, um, thoroughgoing professionals and um, it was very well paid. I was very well looked after. I was, it was a lovely bunch of people. It was a fantastic job on the, on the borders of the Barossa Valley, you know, going around the wineries on the weekend sort of thing in the downtime. Jindabyne was unique in the way that it was made. Ray Lawrence is unique. He's a madman in a wonderful, wonderful way. The first week of it was hell. It was extremely challenging. And he, Ray would be off with Gabriel Byrne and Laura Linney and, and all this a pantheon of Australian heavyweights sort of um, doing the work that needed to be done in a very short amount of time. And there wasn't a lot of time for me. And um, so I just was left to sort of muddle through. I didn't want to go and see the rushes and things. And Ray's like, you should come and see the rushes. You should come and see the rushes. And I was like, I don't, I don't want to come and see the rushes. I want to just be in this world. Um, and uh, he said, how are you going? And uh, oh, at, the, at, the, at the rap party, I said, you know, I wanted to punch you on the nose. At the end of that first week, and he's like, yeah, I could tell that. <laughs> the character that I played um, and I don't know how much I should say, um, is still very much alive and kicking um, and is apparently a respected business person in contemporary times in New Zealand. And um, there was, I think, four different name changes of the character for legal reasons. I had a way to play Big Ari as a Greek, channeled my father. <laughs> And um, they were make, going to make a nationality change, literally like the day before we shot it, started shooting. And I was like, do you know what? I don't know what that accent is. I can go and find out and I can go and learn it and I can go and do it, but that'll take a month. And um, um, so they were like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then they just fell back on calling the character Big Ari, which was a complete invention. One of the things that I, I didn't like about that production was that these two um, um, uh, characters, uh, the two leads, were portrayed as very uh, charming, very sort of debonair, lovely fellows. And the truth is, to my mind, like much of the Underbelly franchise, is that they are scum. They are violent, murderous, vicious scum, and they belong in jail. And um, it's a very fine line television has to tread to make the audience want to go on their journey. So you have to like them in some degree. So there's a little bit of television magic, shall we say, that um, pitches these characters in a particular light, which, um, and as far as I'm concerned, they should all just be in jail forever. Playing Derek Peterson, what a bastard. <laughs> It's just a joy. And I didn't until the fourth episode that uh, James Griffin wrote really understand who Derek was. And it was the oyster eating scene, the, the um, and the, what a distasteful human being Derek Peterson actually is became clear to me. I was like, oh, great. I see where to go <laughs> with this chap. And I'm very much looking forward to how it plays out, knowing where it's going to go.
this was um, put me in a really interesting position because Derek is obviously a potential um, bad guy. Is obviously a potential maybe Derek did it or for some reason Derek did it. And um, it's all very well and good for the protagonists of the show, for Antonia's character to sort of wander around through the story going, oh, I wonder who that person is. Oh, I wonder why that happened. It's, it's, that's the character's journey, is to not know and to have things revealed as they go. If you're the antagonist, um, one of the antagonists, then it was so much harder because, um, I mean, she had a workload 100 times bigger than I did, and it was not harder in that respect, but I found it difficult um, because I didn't know what was underlying the motivation of what the character was saying and doing. And there were times where I would literally just drop out of a scene and, um, <clears throat> and say to the director, can you tell me why I care? 